Welcome to the Whiskey and Wisdom Podcast, coming to you from the Cargo District Recording Studios in Wilmington, North Carolina, where we discuss the most fascinating topics of life. I'm Tyler Yaw with my co-host, Chris Kelly, and each week we interview a special guest to learn how they acquired their wisdom over a glass of whiskey. So sit back, pour yourself a glass, and enjoy Whiskey and Wisdom. Welcome back to the Whiskey Wisdom Podcast, everybody. This is your co-host, Tyler Yaw, and today I am with... Chris Kellum. And our special guest today is... Adam Tart. Thank you so much for coming in. Yeah. Thanks and for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Before we get too far into the story and everything, because I know in the past few weeks we've jumped into a few things before we got into the whiskey. <laughs> so, Chris, what are we sipping on today? We have another bottle of Weller. This is the Antique 107. I mean... Super classic. If you know Weller, you know, you know it's a good, clean bottle. It's obviously labeled 107 because it's 107 proof. Tasting notes are supposed to be um, some floral notes coupled with vanilla, and then there should be a more spicy and cinnamon finish. But let's check it out. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's pretty good. It's pretty smooth for a 107, too. Yeah. Oh, it's a lot of cinnamon. Yeah, you definitely get cinnamon yeah. harder on the nose yeah. and on the palate before. Not like in a bad way. It's not like fireball, it's not, but it's, it's, like it's <laughs> right. tasting true cinnamon. Right. Yeah, I like oh. that. It's different. Like, it's crazy to taste the difference between proofs because we just tried the rye. Like mm-hmm. it, um, and it was 90. For, yeah, which is 90. So for our listeners, it was a couple weeks ago. For us, it was four hours ago. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But t- tasting back to back is what's really interesting. So ninety like went down super smooth. There was no burn at all. Right. As soon as you pump it up, seventeen percent or seventeen proof, um, yeah. you, you can get, taste a little you, bit more. Right, right, right. But it kind of fits with the cinnamon. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I feel like anything under one ten is like casual. Yeah, and you can mix it, but. Once you hit that 115, you hit 115, you're like, right. Yeah. It starts burning a little bit more when yes. it's going down. That's right. That's right. <sighs> it's hard to beat Weller. Hard yeah. To beat Weller though. This is only so like the sorry. third Weller I've ever had. Oh yeah. I think it's, this is the third different Weller. I've had Weller multiple times, but like this is the third different one that Type I've had. Weller. Yeah. Right. Sure. Sure. No, I'm, I'm just over here chilling. I think I had full proof. Um, That's the one I've typically had. This one, and then, what was that, Special? The special Reserve. Special Reserve, yeah, yeah, which is the rye, yeah. yeah. I've had the yeah. Special Reserve, and then this is, so this is just my second while there, but that Special Reserve oh, yeah. is really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's probably one of my top now, too. So that, that Reserve, and now we just tried the Jameson 18 oh, okay. before you came in. Okay. That one's probably up there in the top five as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, nice. We need to do it. We should do one of those episodes again. I know it doesn't get a lot of rank. Thank you. Oh, I yeah, know, yeah, but right. it's fun for us. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> right. It's part of what you do. People rely on you for that too. Yeah, right? yeah. For sure. So is whiskey your typical liquor of choice? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. You know, and that's one of those things that probably just, just you know, peaked up for me about maybe three years ago or mm-hmm. so. You know, some buddies kind of getting into the bourbon and whiskey scene. I was like, okay, you know, let, yeah. me, let me try that out. But I, but I really enjoy it. I mean, I, yeah. I kind of like the, I can get a little bit snobby about things. So, yeah. so, so co- coffee is my other thing. I get pretty Same. snobby about yeah. coffee. Okay. So yeah, the, the bourbon and the, the whiskey thing of, of, I enjoy, but I also, it's like, I don't know if this is something I, like a hobby I should, I should really, <laughs> right. cause I've got tons of bottles and my wife's like, what, what are you doing bringing home another bottle? Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, I, it's like books. Yes. Everyone's like, Oh, why do you, I'm like, Cause I like books. I like books. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'll probably read it once right. and then it'll sit up there. <laughs> yeah. It's like, but you could go to a library. I'm like I could also go to a bar. <laughs> yeah. right. I'm still going to have liquor at the house. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It, ironically, I'm the same with books as well. Cause my wife's been great. Like, about, you know, going to the library and all that, but I just, I have to have a copy. Like, I right. Just, yeah. And I need the hard copy. I'm not a big e-reader type of person. I need the hard copy, mm-hmm. something I can highlight in and, and all that stuff for sure. Yeah. I can't do the, the eBooks either or even the audio books. Like I love podcasts. I love listening to podcasts when it comes to like audio books. I just, yeah. I can't do it. Yeah. 
I will do audio book and I, and I, I do listen to audio books. I used to, when I first started going down that path, I had a hard time with retention of the right, material. Yeah. So then I got into this thing was like, okay, well I'll listen to an audio book, but I'll listen to it twice in a row. Mm. And that helped a good bit back in, back at that point I was, I was living kind of, I was like up towards surf city. So I was commuting back and forth to Wilmington every day, had a lot more time on the road. Right. So it made it, it was a really good environment just to kind of listen to a book in, in the vehicle or whatever. I'm not, I don't have that long of a commute now. So, so it's cut down quite a bit, yeah. But, but yeah, a big reader, absolutely love consuming information, love books, but yeah, I've got to have the copy. I, I can't, <laughs> I can't take something and give it back. I was like, I, this has got to stay in the library. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. I'm my, my, I was just gonna say my new thing. Like if there's a book that I like have saw out that, there's something in it that I know I'm trying to garner from it. Yeah. I'll also get the audio book. So I'll listen to oh, it. Yeah. And then after I listen to that chapter, I'll go back and read it. Oh, there you and go. And then I retain so much more that way. That's great. Yeah. But you're hitting but, both those, you yeah. know, you're hitting the visual and the auditory. You don't video. do them at the same time. You don't listen to the audio book <laughs> while you're reading. That would probably drive me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how you, I've heard of people doing that. And I was yeah. like, I can't, I can't wrap my head around that. I don't no, know. I don't yeah. Know it's too I much for me. <laughs> I've, the last time I heard somebody doing it, they were like, all right, so if you want to train yourself to read faster, you listen to the audio book at like 1.5. Okay. And so your brain is seeing the word and hearing it. And so eventually you can like oh. speed, like pick up. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, huh. Yeah. I but like it that. only works if when you're reading a book, you hear the words versus if you see pictures or right. Like so right. It just depends yeah. on how you read. Yeah, however you retain that information. Yes. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> anyway, we started off on tangent early in the I love episode. It. <laughs> so, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah. So, well, first of all, I was born and raised in Wilmington, and uh, you don't you don't find that much anymore. But just yeah, absolutely, you and Chris have that call. Yeah, just absolutely love the city. Where'd you go to high school? Laney. Nice. Okay. Yeah, went to Laney. But yeah, just just love the city and and love kind of the what I've seen evolve in in the community and in the city since growing up here. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. when I was a kid, Wilmington was a very different space. You know, and mm-hmm. so some of what I've observed over the course of of my life is just a lot of like positive growth, positive culture coming in. You know, the restaurant scene, the right. the, the 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 bar scene, the breweries. Like it's just a it's just a fantastic kind of culture growing here. Yeah. What we've done with the riverfront. I mean, it's mm-hmm. just it's just a beautiful area. It's hard for me to imagine living anywhere else. But yeah, so so born and raised in Wilmington. I've got I've been married for twenty years. I've got two daughters, nice. a fifteen year old and a twelve year old. Ooh. So they keep me very busy. I and, believe it. <laughs> uh, you know, raising a couple of teenage daughters is not for the faint of heart, but I'm having a good time, having a good time. I have a firm called Cap3, mm-hmm. and Cap3 is essentially, we kind of kind of got our start in the world of accounting and finance and really partnering with business owners that had kind of gotten themselves to the place in their business and their evolution of their business and the growth in their business where they they recognized they had a need in the area of accounting and finance. You know, as you can imagine, a lot of business owners decide to start a business because they're they're passionate about a product or a service, right? Yeah, maybe they're yes. maybe they're fantastic at you know HVAC, or maybe they're an interior designer, or maybe they're a contractor, and and they probably didn't have this this season of life where they're like sitting around saying, "Man, you know, I really love analyzing financial statements. You know, <laughs> right. I love booking transactions and you know and and, and managing a balance sheet." Yeah. And so so they get into business because because they're passionate about something, but it's so important to have really good sound financial practices in their business. And so, so that's kind of how we were birthed. We were birthed Mm -hmm. out of recognizing a significant need in that space, but it's really grown into this. We're just passionate about seeing entrepreneurs be successful. And so one of the things that we've recognized over the course of working with business owners is there's a lot of unanswered questions for business Mm -hmm. owners. You know, there's a lot of needs in, in the space of running and growing a business. And so kind of finance and accounting is, is where we started, but uh, we get asked questions in the, in the marketing space, the HR space, legal, you know, operational. And so our long-term vision is that we, we grow into a firm that offers kind of all back office types of services mm-hmm. for businesses. But right now we are uh, partnering with entrepreneurs in the, in the world of finance and marketing. So we'll, we'll provide fractional CFO services, fractional CMO services on the marketing side. And again, what drives us, what drives us is just seeing people be successful. That's something that I noticed too, being in the financial services industry as well, is as soon as someone trusts you with their finances, it's such an intimate type of yeah. business transaction to be in 
that they will ask you about all of those other aspects. Like, Hey, if I already trust you with this, I'm going to trust you for your referrals for marketing or HR or whatever the case may be. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, you think about something that's, that's more scary or personal than, than, you know, your finances, right? Yeah, handing someone over the keys to your, you know, your bank logins and, and all that. Right. So, so yeah, there's a, we, we garner just an immense amount of trust as we, as we work with entrepreneurs and, and it's, it, we really do kind of become like a family. I mean, we're, mm-hmm. you know, our clients, we're, we're having conversations with them on a daily basis. And so we're, we're very much kind of a part of their team and, yeah. and they see us that way. And, and then that trust grows and, and then they see also, in our world, since we, since we deal with all, all kinds of different business owners and industries and uh, all over the country, they see that we're, you know, we have experience in things that maybe they haven't come across yet, or they're, they're, they're new to facing. And so these might be things that we see from in different industries and different companies all over the country. And so we're able to really speak into and give insight into areas that this business owner wouldn't have another option to, to, to to really learn about. And so it's been really, it's been really fruitful. For some of our listeners that don't completely understand, so they, I'm sure they may have heard the term fractional CFO before, and you kind of touch on it a little bit, but can you dive in a little bit more on what a fractional CFO actually does? Yeah, absolutely. So fractional CFO, so the, the acronym CFO, for, for those that may not be aware, it's, it stands for chief financial officer. So in organizations, mm-hmm. when you look at the, the professionals or the team members that an organization will have. Uh, own staff that kind of run their accounting and their finances. We call that a finance team or an accounting team. And at the executive level of that finance team is typically someone that's titled CFO or mm-hmm. chief financial officer. And so as you can imagine for, for large businesses, businesses that have, that, you know, are in the multi-million, multi-billion dollar annual revenue, those are the types of organizations that will have, you know, chief financial officers on staff. These are yep. people that have, you know, lots of years of experience in their industry. They come on staff and they run the accounting function, the finance function for that business. But for the rest of small business America, mm-hmm. America, which, which by the way, it's our, how our economy is driven is, you know, yeah. small to medium sized businesses. Yeah. And so you, you, this, this thing popped up many years ago, kind of a fractional, fractional approach to providing finance support uh, to businesses. And so the term fractional CFO or outsourced CFO kind of was, was birthed. And it was really just out of this need to try to give businesses the, the type of insight value and strategy that they would have if they had someone on staff working full time in that capacity, but small to medium sized businesses typically can't afford those types of salaries. Yeah, right. And so, yeah. so, so we provide that service, but there, and there are some great solutions for fractional or outsourced CFOs out there in the marketplace, both in Wilmington and all over the country, obviously we do it a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that we recognized pretty early on was that we have a hard time really being able to give a business owner true insight and advice if we don't feel comfortable that the numbers they're using, the numbers that are reported are accurate. Right. And so so that's kind of where, where CAP3 and traditional fractional CFO firms differ a little bit. There are some phenomenally smart individuals out there that are fractional CFOs and have really wise and have a lot of great information we have not been able to figure out a way where we can feel comfortable giving strategic insight and advice using someone else's numbers. So cap three comes in and takes over the whole accounting function. So we want to be the ones kind of handling the the granular daily accounting. We want to be handling your paying your bills, running your payroll, doing all of the reporting so that we're confident that the systems and processes are set up correctly and properly. Mm -hmm. And then we can trust the information to give you, to give you good insight from a financial perspective. So since we're on that a little bit, you kind of touched on it. I mentioned that I was going to be interviewing you today to a couple of my small business friends and they're like, okay, that's, that's great. But I have a CPA already. What, what, what's a CFO, a fractional CFO going to do for me? Yeah. So there's a, there's this, popular, I think, misconception among yeah. so many business owners out there. And I think if I were to have, you know, one of Wilmington's many phenomenal tax repairs, CPAs sitting next to me, we would probably be very aligned on this topic. Right. And that is that so many business owners confuse the tax repair or the CPA with someone that's supposed to be helping them manage their daily finances and their yep. business. And those are two completely different uh, roles. Yeah. And in fact, most often what I have seen is the business owner not be clear on that distinction and make decisions that aren't helpful for their business because Mm -hmm. they're believing 
that that tax repair is providing that service. And it's not the tax repair's job. Yep. And I haven't met tax repairs that claim that that's their job, mm-hmm. right? Unless there's some interesting engagement that's going on, which is perfectly fine. But most tax repairs are taking your financials at the end of a tax year. They're preparing yeah. a tax return and they're filing a tax return for you. Yep. That's their job. You know, so they're taking information you give them. They're putting it into their processes and their software. They're doing their reviews and then they're submitting a tax return. Mm -hmm. Whereas, whereas I have seen actually that get businesses uh, in trouble. I'll I'll give you a quick story because this was a conversation I just had this past week with, Mm -hmm. with a, with a new client and they were kind of expressing, this was not frustration from, this was not expressing a frustration about their taxpayer. This was expressing a frustration of their understanding that, Hey, we need help. And Mm -hmm. that's, this was uh, about a year or so ago, they get they uh, coming to the end of a year and they're talking with their taxpayer and the taxpayer is like taking the financial information and saying, okay, yeah, you, you, you've got a significant amount of profit here. You need to go and spend some money to, to reduce your tax liability. Go, go buy a truck, go buy yeah. this, go buy that, go buy some equipment. So the business owner's like, all right, sounds good. Let me go buy some equipment. Let me go buy a truck. Let me go do some things to kind of uh, reduce my tax liability. And then the year ends, tax, tax return gets prepared and the story's different. And the story is different because the business owner had three or four months worth of expenses missing from their business. Mm -hmm. They were missing from their financial records. So when they handed it over to the tax preparer (laughs) to do this review, the tax preparer didn't know that. It wasn't wasn't their job to know that. Uh, Their job was to see what the book said, give give information. And so that happens all the time. I mean, it happens all Mm -hmm. the time. So many many times I've had situations where we engage with a client. We start to kind of take a review of everything, take a look at everything. And I've had clients – very sophisticated businesses in large cities that have been around a long time. And we start an engagement and they're missing 14 months of credit card transactions. Wow. And so Mm -hmm. you can imagine your financial picture is very different if you're missing Mm -hmm. that many months of transactions. And so I think it's a, it's a great, it's a great point that you bring up. And Mm -hmm. it's something that I see all the time that there's just this misunderstanding of what the tax repairs role is and what something like a CFO or a finance team, what their role is, because they are two very different things. Yeah, because I, I see that all the time too with what I do on the personal side, right? Is so like, oh, I have a CPA. They already told me that I have a, I have a small business. They told me that I need a Roth IRA. Right. That's great. Did they tell you what to put in it? <laughs> right. <Exactly. laughs> it's like, no. It's right. like there's a whole huge piece of the pie that you're yes. missing here. Yeah. And, and if you there's some CPAs that are also CFAs and, or whatever, the, mm-hmm. C, CFPs that are out there. Yeah. And I'm sure they can give great advice too. But a lot, especially in Wilmington, aren't that. Correct. And I think, I think really it's just, again, it's all these, these disparate professional functions, right? Mm-hmm. So you're, you deal with personal finance. We've got people to deal with, with business finance. You've got legal, you've got, you've got tax prep, you've got, you know, marketing and all these different things. And they all perform their functions really, really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for a lot of business owners, what's missing is that comprehensive, like somebody to wrap their arms around the whole thing right? and say, Hey, like, I understand this is what legal told you. I understand this is what tax told you. I understand this is what, you know, personal finance told you, but, but is anyone looking at the whole picture, right? right? Can we get all the professionals around the table together to have a Mm -hmm. conversation to help you as the business owner make better decisions? And that, that's one of the conversations that we have to our new prospects too, is like, Hey, are you willing to bring in your CPA and your legal team for all of us to sit at the table together? Because if you want to keep those really separate, we may not be the team for you because we want to have that like holistic, comprehensive view of where to take the first step. I can't tell you one way to go if your legal team is taking you one way and your CPA is taking you another. And I'm sure you see that even more so on the business side. It's so tough. It's so tough because you're really, you're putting the profession, in my opinion, you're putting the professionals at a huge disadvantage. Like yeah. if we can't get everybody around the table to work together for you as a business owner, you're, yeah. you're putting the professionals at a, at a huge disadvantage because they've got incomplete information. Right. And then what you can do, even as a business owner, is you can find yourself duplicating, duplicating effort and duplicating your resources, mm-hmm. right? Because you might be, you know, compensating a fractional CFO and a, and a personal finance, a CFP and a, and an attorney all to be kind of working on the same types of objectives and problems to get at the same time, but they're working at from different angles yep. and they don't know the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. And then you end up wasting time and resources and missing out on opportunities right? yeah. rather than bringing everybody together. The other thing I see a lot of small business owners doing too, is they're like, well, I already gave this information to my CPA, so I don't need to give it to my CFO. And then like my legal team doesn't need to know that because I'm not getting sued. And you're like, no, no. Oh my gosh, <laughs> It's really, you know, it's, it's, it, I'm empathetic about it because I think it is, it's an uncomfortable thing you right. know, for business owners that, 
again, so just thinking about the story of, of the average business over right. the average Joe, average Jane business owner, they start a business and kind of, you know, if, if you trace, you trace your traditional path, it's like so much of it is like, I'm doing everything. I'm, I'm the business owner. Like I, I am marketing, I'm yeah. finance, I'm sales, I'm operations, I'm manufacturing, whatever, like I'm doing everything. All of it. And so as you start to bring in other pieces of the function to make the business work, every iteration of that requires a little bit of like getting outside of your comfort zone, oh, yeah. placing trust in someone else. This is your baby. This is something you built from scratch. And so it can be uncomfortable. And then you start bringing, like, it's one thing to do that with employees, right? but then you start bringing in people from the outside that aren't employees of yours. And that becomes even more uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And, and to your point earlier, like it just, it requires an immense, an immense amount of trust. Oh, absolutely. So, so good. Oh, I was going to ask, do you guys have your own CFO? That's me for now. <laughs> That's me for now. So our team, we have three CFOs on our team apart from myself. I will work with clients directly some, but I am typically pulled into different situations and, and to work with clients on specific issues, specific opportunities. But we have a team of three CFOs and some controllers and some staff accountants on the, on the finance and accounting side of our business. So when clients, when clients decide to, that Cap3 is the right partner for them, we simply, we essentially just put a finance team on that client. So the finance team generally is going to be, you know, a staff accountant, a controller and right. a CFO. And each one of those positions kind of serve a specific function for the yep. client. So you think of that CFO as there's someone that's coming in from a strategic perspective, kind of walking alongside that business owner, that business leader, helping them make better decisions for, for their business. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that we, we hear a lot on the and like Instagram, social media is like, what's your niche? Like, what are you like really focusing in on? So if you were to describe your perfect client, what does that look like? Yeah, great. So, well, first of all, I typically will say, I'll I'll, t- I'll make a phrase like this, like we're agnostic about what industry, like, right. be- because I, I think that, I think that one of the ancillary value ads that cap three has for our clients is that we work in so many different industries and mm-hmm. Interestingly, you can learn something in a professional services industry that can be applied to a manufacturer or to a contractor or or whatever. And so I like, I don't ever see us kind of evolving into this place where we, where we stick with one industry. Mm -hmm. What's most important from, for us, from an ideal client standpoint is like, uh, a, this is a business owner that uh, we enjoy working with, right? So <laughs> exactly. they need to be a business owner that we can see is passionate about their team, mm-hmm. passionate about their marketplace, mm-hmm. believes in what they do, and then also recognizes the need, right? right? So it doesn't, we would be kind of the worst finance team in the world if we were advising a client to continue engaging us if they're not going to listen to what, right. to the advice that we're giving, right? So, yes. so we want, we want clients that are open to hearing our advice, hearing our insight. It doesn't mean we make the decisions for them. It's always right. the business owner's decision. And it doesn't mean that we live in some world where we expect a business owner to agree with everything we're saying. That, that's mm-hmm. not it. But we do need to see that we're making some level of impact. One of our core values as an organization is impact. And right. like it, we have to, we use that as a decision metric. And if, if, if we're not making an impact for a business, it doesn't make sense for us. It doesn't make sense for, right. for the business. So, so we want to see somebody who's passionate about their team, passionate about what they're doing, believes in what they're doing. And then, and then they see the value in, in what we're bringing to them. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I'm just... It's like when Tyler's in my conversations, I'm like, this is the finance world. <laughs> it, like I'm, I'm, f- I'm treading water cause I'm kind of understanding and I'm trying yeah. to like process all, which is things. really funny that you're on now because Chris brought on one of his friends that's yeah. in the like fashion world. Right. And I feel like probably how he does now. I'm like, <laughs> I don't even I don't, know what, what, that. what shoes to put on with my jeans like half the time. So right. <laughs> I, I, I share that with you. Right. As you can tell, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a fashion guy from like, based on what the way I'm dressed, but, but yeah, I, I'll kind of, I'll kind of share. Sometimes I, I think about like, you know, what it's like to run a business without the information that you need. Right. Yeah. So I like to kind of illustrate that. And so I don't know if either of you guys are, are kind of like have a high like technical aptitude or mechanical aptitude, like being able to assemble things and, mm-hmm. and, and stuff like that. So I don't know if you've ever tried putting a grill together, it's but not putting, fun. putting grills yeah. together are, it's not a fun experience, right? Even, and I, I kind of, I'm not like the world's best mechanically inclined person, but I also have a decent aptitude, right. and, you know? Mm-hmm. So much like we talked about, like when I got into to bourbon and whiskey, right. well, there's something about growing up in the Southeast that makes you, you know, as, as a guy growing up in the Southeast, well, you're supposed to be able to know how to smoke a brisket and <laughs> yep. you're supposed to be able to know how to smoke ribs. <laughs> and like, you, you need to be able to man, manage a grill, right? So 
So several months ago, I bought a, I bought a smoker. Yeah. My bought my, bought my first smoker and it was unassembled, which meant I needed to bring it home, unpack it and assemble the smoker. Right. Yeah. So, so here was my experience. I, I get the, I get the smoker home and it's one of those upright, I guess we call it a cabinet smoker or whatever, mm-hmm. upright cabinet smoker and open the box. And on the, on the door of the, the smoker, it says, lay the smoker, lay this on flat on the ground before you start to assemble. So, all right, sounds great. So I'll lay it flat on the ground. All of the contents for the assembly of the smoker are inside the cabinet. Mm-hmm. So I open the door. I start unpacking everything, right? The instruction manual is somewhere buried inside. I'm starting to unpack all the stuff. And I go to close the door back to start the assembly and the door falls off, like completely falls off, hits the ground in my garage and the glass shatters everywhere. Oh no! Right. And so I'm thinking like, what went wrong here? Well, what went wrong, what went wrong was I didn't have the information I needed. Mm-hmm. Like there should have been something that told me remove the door before you do anything else. And in fact, if you get deep down into the instruction books, which were already inside the cabinet, it says in there, remove the door before <laughs> you try to assemble anything, but it was buried inside the packaging. So yeah. you, 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 there was no way I would have seen it first. Right. So I kind of use that illustration to, 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 to say, this is what it's like to run a business, right? Mm-hmm. First of all, running a business is incredibly difficult, <laughs> like owning yeah. and growing and running a business is incredibly difficult. And so imagine going through that exercise that I just described, but doing it blindfolded. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's bad enough that I didn't have the information readily available, but like, um, the thing about assembling a grill is that the next, every grill is the same of that, of that style. So if I assemble it once, I know how to do it again and right. again and again yeah. and again. Small business, unfortunately, doesn't necessarily work that way, right? right. Yeah. So I can get something right today. Mm-hmm. I can make the right decisions today. Market pressures, employee issues, customer issues, whatever can change tomorrow. And that can change my experience and change you know, the competency with which I'm able to run my business. And so so I like to look at assembling, you know, equipment, assembling some type of uh, grill or something like that. Blindfolded is a little bit like what it's like to run a business without the information you need. Mm-hmm. And so cap three or organizations like ours exist to give the business owner the information they need. You can, you can get lost in the numbers, but it's essentially just, Hey, just tell me what I need to know. Yeah, right. it's just, just tell me what I need to know so that I make the right decisions. That's, that's really what we're attempting to do. I think it's funny and also very accurate that people also put running a business very similar to having a child, yeah. right? So, and we talked about this with one of our prior oh, weeks yeah. where when you have a baby, you're like, so both of us have kids. So we have yeah. wives that had children. So like you go to the appointments and they're following up to the appointments all the time. So you kind of feel like you're being handheld, like, okay, this is what you're going to experience next. And kind of like try not completely, but kind of getting a gist of it. You have the kid and then, you're in the hospital for two days and then like you have the nurses kind of taking care of them for you. And then they're like, yep, looks healthy. Have fun. Deuces. And then same thing with the business, oh, yeah. right? Is like, you're getting it started. There's a million different government agencies you can reach out to, to start a business. Yeah. This is how you file your articles. And this is how you create your LLC. This is how you make your bank account. You can go to the government and they'll essentially help you do it step-by-step. Step. As soon as that launches, peace, nothing, good luck. Nothing. That's a great, that's a great analogy. It's so like, you know, you, and, and even going back to having the baby, like you can read all the, we talked about books or right. Like, yeah. I read them all. Like I, like <laughs> before, <laughs> yeah. before I had, before my wife had uh, our first daughter, man, we were reading all the, we were reading oh, all the yeah. parenting books. Like, oh, I got this nail. This is going to be, no, you nope. No, you got no clue. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, and so, so, so much is just learned as you go and there's yeah. no changing that in the world of business. But man, how valuable is it to have someone walking alongside you right. that can help you be on the lookout for the roadblocks, be on the lookout for the obstacles, the challenges that you're going to run into. And and then when you do run into them, like helping you think about how to get around them. How do I get over mm-hmm. this challenge? How do I, how do I work my way through this difficulty in a way that's, that's going to be helpful for my team, helpful for my business, helpful for my marketplace. And, and, and yeah, so I think, I think having, Having, having kids is a great way of thinking about it as well. <laughs> nothing, I, I like to say nothing prepares you for that. And at the end of the day, we make it through, right? right. Like we make it through, we, we, we raise our kids the best we know how we've got people probably speaking into our lives about like, you know, proper ways to kind of think about raising kids and giving us mm-hmm. tips and tricks along the way. And apart from that, man, it would be, 
it'd be incredibly difficult for sure. Right. So actually I just thought about this right now, but I guess it kind of goes in hand in hand with that is the majority of human beings that have babies are able to raise them up yeah. to the age of 18 and yeah. let them go on their own yeah. and give them what they do. What I tend to see happen in the world of business is it's so easy to give up on it when it, times get tough. You can't give up on your kid when times get tough and right. you still bring them to 18. Imagine if those same individuals kept up with their own business the same way that they would with a child. Yeah, I think I think it's a great point because there's a couple of different couple of distinctions, right? I think it is a great analogy that raising kids and, and growing a business. There's a lot of similarities, great analogy. There are a couple of pretty distinct differences, right? right. So if I'm raising a kid and they get to a somewhat self-sustaining age, so I've got a 15 year old and a 12 year old. If for whatever reason I forget to make dinner, <laughs> my kids are going to like, they'll be okay right. because they both know how to like prepare themselves a meal, right? Yeah. Running a business. If, if I take my, if I take my eyes off the ball and like, and I just disconnect and the business actually isn't now I've got competent employees, hopefully, right, yeah. but if, but if I, but if for whatever reason I've neglected that and I haven't built a competent team and I, and I haven't invested the time and the people that, that, that I need to, to make this business self-sustaining, then the business doesn't continue. Right. right? And the, and, and the truth of the matter is, is the vast majority of small businesses that start out there end up failing. Mm -hmm. And that's sad, right? Because it's a huge sacrifice. Yeah. And these business owners, you know, a lot of people that start businesses, they, they pour kind of their life savings into it. Yeah. They've got everything poured into this thing. And to, to, to walk down this road of this difficulty and these challenges and this risk, and then for it to end up failing is, is devastating. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, Again, that's we we want to do everything in our power as an organization to try to to try to empower business owners to make better decisions, like give them the information that they need to be able to do that, to see them be successful, to see them be able to to pour into their teams, to pour into their marketplace, provide real value to 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 their local economy, and it's super rewarding to watch that happen. Something else I was just thinking about too is it may it probably doesn't make sense for the majority of people that just started their business yesterday, let's right. say, right. To take you and hire you on the very next day. Right. Probably doesn't make sense for you. Probably doesn't make sense for them. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so for that individual, what are a few things that they can do today to make sure that they're on the right path? So when they get to that point that they're in a good set place to hand over the reins to you. Yeah, no, that's, I think you're absolutely right. I think that there is a, you know, there's so many businesses out there that still have a need but they may just not be at the at the season of their of their life cycle of their business where where it makes sense to engage as a business owner that might be in the earlier stages of your business like do everything you can to educate yourself mm -hmm. surround yourself with really sharp people kind of my personal endeavor in life is to always be the dumbest person in the room like i i just want to surround myself with people that are smarter than me better than me at all the things right i want to learn everything i can i want to consume information i want to to learn from people that have gone before me um, and so I would say for that business owner that, that it might be early in, in the game for them, surround yourself with smart people, uh, educate yourself, take it upon yourself to, to do that. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of your responsibility. Learn and learn and commit early on to back to earlier. What we talked about is surrounding yourself with good professionals and bringing them all to the table. Like do that early on. Right. If, if, if you've got an attorney involved or if you've got a, a tax repair and involved, like bring, have those conversations jointly. Don't mm -hmm. have these separate conversations. And I think that, you know, even organizations like cap three, we, we have recognized to your point, that so much of the way our business was built is like we were we were bringing in clients that were had that had achieved a certain level of success that made sense for them to bring us on but we we got we grew really uncomfortable with having to walk away from business owners that weren't quite at that stage mm -hmm. so we've changed a couple of things recently whereas we're we're trying to we're trying to make some margin and some room to be able to help business owners that are that are earlier in their life cycle of their business and so so that's one of the things that we're doing you know kind of venturing into some smaller newer businesses and helping with some 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 bookkeeping that doesn't include right. the the CFO type of support we're also doing something that's pretty cool that, you know, I'd, I'd offer your listeners as well is that we're doing a free QuickBooks Online review. So if you're mm. a business owner out there that's using QuickBooks Online and you just want someone to like put some eyes on it to say, like, does these numbers even make sense? Yeah. Our team will do that for you. So you can you can just reach out on our website to the contact form and we'll do a, a free QuickBooks Online review for you. And and some something like something like that can at least help you put point you in the right direction. So we can right. say, hey. 
go ask whoever's handling your accounting, this, this, and this, and it'll help put them on the, on the right path. That's awesome. That's great. That's a very good way of kind of showing, showcasing what you're able to do right. while providing a value to hopefully pay back and right. work in the future. Yeah, right. That's right. great. And I, and I think one of the other things is like, you know, just one last point about that new, that newer business owner is really thinking about how you manage cash. Right. Mm-hmm. So we've probably all heard the term that, you know, cash is the lifeblood of business. Right. And yeah. so, so what we find oftentimes in really multiple life, multiple stages of a life cycle of a business is business owners most often need the most help with understanding where their cash is. Mm-hmm. So it's one thing to be able to pull up your bank account today right. And know where your, where your cash is sitting, but it's a completely different thing to know, okay, what does that mean next week, the week after that, the week after that. Mm -hmm. And so, so much of our work and what we do is spent with uh, being the business owner, understanding how to think about cash and how to think about managing their cash. Right. Makes sense. Trying to think. So as a person who's not a full on business owner presently, Big picture wise, uh, as a CFO, how far into the future do you typically try and look when you're planning for a company? Is that part of the, that talk you have is like, hey, you know, are you looking at the five, 10 year window or are we just looking at the one to three year? Yeah, I would say all of the above, okay. right? So kind of one of the things that we always want to keep our pulse on, keep our fingers on the pulse of is where's the business owner going? Like, what is it that you as a business owner what really caused you to start the business? What were you hoping to accomplish? Yeah. And a lot of times, you know, some of the things we hear is, well, I wanted freedom and yeah. I wanted the ability to kind of do what I wanted when I wanted. I wanted to provide value to the market and all, all those things. Right. But we want to specifically understand like, what does, what is your three-year goal? What is your five, five-year goal? What is your 10-year goal? So those are big picture things that kind of help us guide the types of insight mm-hmm. and, and advice we give. But then to the more granular aspect, like on a weekly basis, we're always going back to the cash management thing. We're always looking a rolling quarter in advance. So I want to know what's going to happen to your cash for the next three months by week. Mm -hmm. So so that as a business owner, you can say, okay, is there something coming down the path here that I need to be aware of? And I need to be kind of like, I need to move some things around to make sure I can cover or are things looking pretty good? And this is giving me an opportunity to to make additional investment in hiring new employees or or whatever it is. So we're kind of looking at the immediate, the near term. So quarterly at the basis or on a quarterly basis, we're always doing an annual operating budget for our clients. And then we're looking at that three, five and 10 year goal. Interesting. So where my profession comes in is typically at the end of those life cycles, yeah, right, right? Right. So when you're typically working with a small business professional, what does the end goal typically look like for them? Just because... For me, working with people my age, looking 20, 30 years down the future, they're like, I don't know what my exit strategy is. So is that something that you find yourself coming across pretty often as well, too? It is, you know, and we don't, we all, by the way, like we don't, we stay in our lane. So we don't pretend to, we don't pretend to be exit planners. We don't pretend to be personal financial planners. We always want to say, Hey, you need to go find a perfect, like we need to bring in a professional to help you on the personal finance Mm -hmm. side. We need to bring in someone to help you think about exit. But yeah, to your point, you know, I, I think the vast majority of the businesses that we work with do have some type of exit in mind. Like they have now it's interesting because sometimes that exit, you know, when you're talking to the business owner, they have these really, really ambitious exit goals. Right. right? <laughs> and then you, and then occasionally, which does happen somewhat, some, somewhat often, uh, occasionally you have the business owners that I'm never going to retire. Like yeah. I, I, I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to be doing this my whole life. And, and then you have to step back and say, well, that that's great. But you do need to understand that like every business owner exits their business one way or the other. Right. Right. <laughs> yes. It's either going to be voluntary or involuntary. Exactly. Yes. And so we need to make sure that we're, we're lining the professionals up that can help you think through those things and help mm-hmm. you think through those decisions and those, those impact points of your business so that you can do this on purpose. Right. right. Yeah. The, the reason I bring that up is there was two specific conversations I've had relatively recently within the past, like two years that with two business professionals that are, again, very large goals. And I think they can accomplish them, but it's like, okay, what's the ag- exit strategy? You have to be working towards something. Yeah. And they're like a tombstone. <laughs> and I was like, well, it may happen sooner than you want it to be. If you that's don't actually right. have yeah. a, an actual plan. That's right. Um, and they're like, Oh, oh that may be a good point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I thought about you. that. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I think it's one of those things. First of all, I mean, you know, for so many business owners that 
the, their identity is their business, right. which mm-hmm. is a difficult, that's a whole conversation in and of itself. Right. But I think that for many business owners, the, their identity is tied up in their business. Mm-hmm. So the thought of like, well, who am I after this business is a daunting, is a, yeah. it's a daunting question and something that's difficult to really devote your attention and focus to, but it's so important because to mm-hmm. your point, you know, we can't control when we can't always control when we're going to exit. And so we right. need to be giving, giving consideration to like what, how do I do this on purpose? How do I leave my employees? Well, how do I leave my family? Well, how do I leave this business in the marketplace? Well, by having a plan. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. And so, so much of our, so much of the work that we do is encouraging our, our clients to, to, to bring in the proper professionals, to give them the advice and insight they need to, to a get their business to the next level, but B give them a, give them an understanding of what happens after them. Right. Right. Because, you know, there's a going back to books, the E-Myth uh, by Michael Gerber. Oh, yeah. You know, if it's a if the business doesn't operate without you, then it's mm-hmm. not a business. Right. No. Yeah. So we, we have to set something up that will allow the business to operate without you as a business owner. And then that gives you that's where your freedom come from. That's where your freedom comes from. It's like gives you the ability to start to then work on the business rather in the business and develop a plan for the business to, to survive you. Yeah. There's a local business coach, Coach Reggie. I don't oh, know yeah. if you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure do. Yep. And so I went through one of his programs as well. And they, they talked a lot about that is that you don't want to be the business. Yeah. It's, it's not good for you and it's not good for the business. No. And for any of our listeners that may not have their own business and they may be like a W2 employee or something, it's still very similar for that individual as well. So we actually see that a lot during retirement. There's actually a huge depression cycle that a lot of our clients go through or that most people go through, not even just our clients, because we try to we try to hedge that as best we yeah, can. Yeah. So, so you're not going through that issue. But a lot of people, like you said, their identity is what they've done their whole life. Yeah. So you may be a um, a like construction worker with GE for the last yeah. 30 years. You retire and they're like, now what do I do with my life? Yeah. Like, who do I hang out with now? Like what, where am I supposed to get my joy from? Like what, what value am I giving to the world? So it's kind of thinking about that process. And even the people that are planning on leaving an industry, moving into a different industry, they tend to have that same that I- identity issue as well too. So just being yeah. proactive and thinking about that. I think that's great that you do that for your, cause I, mm-hmm. and, and it is so true. You know, some of the, some of the conversations that we're having with business owners as they are giving consideration to exit again, right. we're not planning their exit per se, but we are encouraging them to set up the right structures internally in their business to give themselves a little more freedom of time before mm-hmm. they exit so that they understand how to spend their time when it's not right. in the business. For instance, I've got a client that uh, we've done a lot of work with over the course of the last few years, and I've just seen him grow so much as a business owner. Uh, phenomenally, phenomenally smart guy, great business owner, has done a great job building a, a fantastic business. But really had to work with him about how to how to kind of loosen the grip a little bit uh, yeah. in the business and to start to spend his time outside of his business, you know, pursuing hobbies, pursuing, mm-hmm. you know, activities that can keep him busy mm-hmm. so that when an exit comes along, he's already plugged right in. Right. right. So this particular example, I mean, he's got he's got a, a hatteras that he's restored. And so he's like oh, he nice. goes and spends now. Now we, we've kind of developed a structure with him where he can go spend weeks, weeks sailing down to the Caribbean and just kind of oh, hanging great. out and, and doing those types of things so that he's got something like when he decides to fully exit, yeah. he's, he's got a, he's got a lifestyle built, right? He's got a, he's got a hobby built and he's got something that he's going to fall right into, which would be nice. Oh, that's neat. So Very cool. I have a question because yeah. you've worked with people at the front end of their business and near the end, what would success look like for you? Like within the business as well as within yours? Yeah. So I think ultimately understanding, so success for my clients, I'll start mm-hmm. there. <clears throat> you know, in the early conversations when we're talking about working with the clients, like, what do you want to accomplish? What is it that you like? Why did you start this business? Why do you think this is important? What drives you every day? And so success is how do we, how do we get you in a, on a meaningful path to accomplish those objectives? Right. And mm-hmm. so if we can help put the pieces together so that you're going and saying, Hey, well, I, I want to be able to re- retire at 55. I want to have a house on the beach and I want to have, you know, the ability to, to like, you know, provide for school for my grandkids. Right. So if those are your objectives as a business owner, like we need to make sure we put the pieces in place to help you accomplish those things. So success is 
are we working toward that goal? Are we getting closer to it? Are we, or, you know, that's success. We're getting closer to it. If we're farther, if we're, if we're falling farther away from it, then that's not success. So we need to make Mm -hmm. sure that we're, that we're working toward that personally for my business. The thing you ask our team, like the thing that drives me most is impacting as many lives as possible. I don't know what it is about. Like it just, I'm just wired that way. Like I just want to see people's lives changed and I want to see people's lives changed because of having dealt with cap three, having dealt with me personally, like that's what drives me is I just want to improve people's lives. And so success for us, success for me personally is how can we use the vehicle that cap three is the resource that it is to improve as many lives as humanly possible. And so it's not, so it doesn't stop with the business owner, right? Mm -hmm. So like kind of our mission statement as an organization is, is we improve the lives of business owners, but that's not where it stops. It's, it's like, if the business owner is successful, then that's going to spill over into their teams. And if, and if their teams are successful, it spills over to their families and to the, to their local economies and to their marketplace. And so we just, we just want to see as many lives changed in a positive way as humanly possible. (laughs) And that's what success looks like for us. So silly question. I might've missed it. What's cap three stand for? Or like, where'd the name come from? So, so it is an acronym, but we really, it's the acronym is consulting, accounting, planning aligned. It's, it's probably, it's probably losing its acronym. Like it's not going to be something that's referred to, or we even refer to now, especially as we, as we grow into some other business services. So right now cap three is finance, accounting, and marketing, Mm -hmm. but I can see the day where we're bringing in some operational support, some HR support, some maybe possibly even legal support, those types of things to help business owners have everything they need to be successful in their business. Let them go do what they're passionate about, what they love to do which is typically not the HR side or the marketing <laughs> side or the, or the finance side, yep. but, but let them go, go be creative. Let them go manage customer relationships. Let them go do whatever. And, and we come in and kind of help provide all the back office support. That's great. Before I get into my last question, I have one question before that. Yeah. So if there was one thing that the community, especially Wilmington, cause that's primarily where our listeners are from one way that they can help you. What's one way that our community could help you? Oh man, you know, I think ultimately, again, we just have such a passion for the city and, you know, we, we do, we do deal with clients all over the country, which in some sense is, is, is pretty cool and mm-hmm. it's, it's exciting and, and we enjoy that. But over the last year and a half or so, like we've really just renewed our focus on this city. Right. And it doesn't mean that I'm not interested in talking to, to potential clients outside of Wilmington, but. I don't know. It just got this burning passion for seeing Wilmington continue to thrive. So I would say like, how can Wilmington help? It, it's, you know, we all have, we all, Wilmington's a small enough city that we're all pretty connected with yeah. one another. Yep. Like, you know, while, while you and I might not know each other per- personally today, we probably know some of the same people. And so I, I think as you're, as you're kind of talking to friends, family, acquaintances that, that are business owners and they start to to voice some frustration or some concerns or some challenges that they're facing in business, think of, think of people you can point them to. If that happens to be cap three, fantastic, right? If, if we can add value, fantastic. Mm-hmm. If it's not, that's okay. Point them to somebody that can help them. It's too big of a sacrifice. It's too important to, to you as a business owner, to your family, to your team's family, to, to leave it to chance, like Mm -hmm. get the people you need around you, surround yourself with smart, passionate people, and let's go do this thing. Right. And, and, and again, if cap three can help you with that, like we want to do that, but ultimately if we can't still call me, cause I've got, I've got a lot of people in our circle that we deal with on a regular basis in all the different professions and so if you're, if you're someone out there that is a business owner or knows a business owner and you need some support with any area of business, even if it's not accounting, finance, or marketing, give us a call. Cause like there's chances are, I've got someone I can send you that mm-hmm. can be really, really oh, impactful nice. for you. Yeah, that's great. And the reason why I asked that question is you're talking a lot about how you're, how you want to impact the community and really want to really do something to help people. And I'm the, I'm very much the same way. And then we have a mutual friend, Catherine Bruner. Who's a real estate agent in town. Who's very much the same way yeah. too. And something that she brought up and the reason why I asked you that is she goes, a lot of people who want to do really well, don't take the time to think about what can others do for them to help <laughs> refill that cup for others. Right. And it didn't really like resonate with me until she said it to me. And I was like, that may be right. Oh, <laughs> so it's always interesting for me to ask that question to others who really want to help and make it 
huge difference in a good way, right? Yeah. To the, to the community, to ask that question to them, to see what that answer may be. Yeah. I love that question because it is something that oftentimes we kind of forget to sit mm-hmm. back and ask ourselves like, wait, wait, wait a minute. Like, yeah, right. Actually, is there anything people can do to help us? Uh, yeah. And I, I love taking the, taking the opportunity to just kind of sit back and reflect, reflect on that. Right. I think is, is really powerful. Um, and you know, the other thing about people, people, people like that, like, you often don't find successful people that don't want to help people. Right. Like successful people want to see people be successful. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're someone out there that's like struggling with something, a challenge in your business or in life or whatever, uh, seek out someone that's done it well. And I can almost guarantee you that person wants to help you. Oh yeah. I can almost guarantee you if you see someone that's done it well, they want to help you because yep. it's very rare for you to find someone that's like, ah, I'm not giving you any, <laughs> I'm not giving you any assistance or tips or tricks or, or whatever. You just don't find that. That's not, right. that's not how we're built. Exactly. So my, my real last question now, since we're heading up on an hour already is if you were to tell your younger self one thing, what would it be? Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, uh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. I think what I would have said was, start having a burning desire to learn much earlier than I did in life. Like Mm -hmm. I do have a burning desire to learn everything I possibly can. Now it's, it can almost be, it can almost be a fault. Like where I just want to sit in a room and read and not actually take action on the things that I'm, that Mm -hmm. I'm reading. So, so I recognize that that's a, that's actually an obstacle or a challenge for me. But I think early on my younger years, I didn't care much about school. Like, you know, I did okay. I didn't really didn't have to, I didn't have to put in the extra effort to just mm-hmm. kind of to get by. And so I think if I, if I was writing a letter or, or talking to my younger self, I was like, Hey man, you know, get around the right people, yeah. get around the right people that care about you as a human and want to see you be successful. And that will pour into you and devote their time and attention and energy to seeing you accomplish things, consume all the information you can like learn from smart people. I, I would have encouraged me, I think to be, to be a lifelong learner much earlier in life. Mm. Yeah. I like that. That was very similar to my story as well, too. It's like I was good enough to get by, yeah. but it was also like that story. It's like, oh, well, school, whatever. And then like <laughs> here I am how, however many years later and I have a master's degree. And I was like, if I just would have put the effort in the right way, <laughs> like I, I could have done <laughs> yeah. this so much easier. hundred percent. hundred percent. So I got two, two final questions. Yeah. Real talk. What are two books that have made an impact on you over the past, like, 12 months. Wow. I'll tell you, I'll tell you one book has nothing to do with accounting finance. You could kind of say it relates to business, but it's, it's, I'll give you two titles. I'll give you two titles, bro. They're by the same authors, mm-hmm. leadership and self-deception and the, no, I'm not gonna remember the other one. Leadership and self-deception is by the Arbinger Institute and the anatomy of peace is the second one. And they're both by the Arbinger, Arbinger Institute. Okay. And here's why I think they're impactful is that I think that the way we view the world and the way we view the people that work alongside us, the people that work for us, the, the, our customers, our, our, our clients, everybody, I think the way we view them really informs how we go about doing our business, how we go about interacting with the world, how we, how we think about what we're called to do as humans. And so yeah. both of these books deal with really how you, how you view people and how you work through conflict, right? So Business, business is difficult enough with all the decisions you have to make as a business owner and the things that you have to kind of the challenges that you come across. But the other side that makes it, that makes it additionally difficult would be managing all the relationships, managing, managing the, the dynamic of people mm-hmm. and humanity, right? Yeah. So, because I, I tell our team all the time, like, there's one thing that I know to be true. And that's every day somebody's walking in the doors to our, to our company, to our mm-hmm. office, carrying something inside that you know nothing about. Mm-hmm. Like everybody, everybody in our business is dealing with something personally that you know nothing about. And so we need to remember that as we view them as humans, like we need to, we need to remember that as we view them as employees, as clients, as vendors, as whatever. Right. So, um, I think that, I think that those two are are big. And then I mentioned e earlier. I think, you know, if I were to recommend kind of one business book to an entrepreneur, especially an entrepreneur that's a little bit earlier in their, in mm-hmm. their business journey, yeah. I think the, the E-Myth by Michael Gerber would be one that I would absolutely recommend people mm-hmm. to read. Interesting. That's great. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this. Yeah. I haven't so, read either one. So that's that good to put on the list. Yeah. Yeah. They're good. Yeah. I tried, even if I don't have questions that will make any sense, <laughs> I, when my brain clicks, it's like, I bet you 
like, because we talked about books at the beginning. Right. I'm like, I bet you've read some good books. And we have so many business owners and entrepreneurs who listen to this podcast. And they're going to be like, you know, I haven't read that one yet. And it's just good to. Yeah, that's a, suggestions. That, that's a that's a that's a risky question for me because I could I could just sit here and I could just sit here and spout yeah. like if we get to go another hour I'll just spout off books right, right. <laughs> <laughs> for See, sure that's that's why I, st- I was like all right so over the past twelve months yeah I that feel was like good. That was good. if if you start reading books and you, you've learned a lot it's not something that's happened all within like yeah. a year it's 100%. something that's been happening over the past like five ten. 20 years of your life where you're just growing and getting better. So I'm like, you know, it's yeah, yeah. always good to help. hundred percent. Yeah. That's great. Uh, so my real last question, All right. where can people like reach out to you guys if they wanted to like use your services yeah. or just help suggest you guys to somebody else? Yeah. So uh, our website's super easy. It's uh, www.gocap3.com. So G O C A P the number three.com. You can go on the website. You can, we've got our phone number obviously on there, but fill out a contact form, super easy, fill out a contact form. If you happen to be interested in that books online review, that quick look at QuickBooks online, if you happen to be a business center that's using that and need just a second set of eyes on it, fill out that contact form and we'll, we'll be in touch to, to kind of arrange that for you. But, but going to the website, it's the easiest thing. Our phone number's on there. We're here local. We've got an office. We actually work in an office. Yeah. So we're on New Center Drive. So if you happen to be uh, rolling down New Center Drive here in Wilmington, you'll see our office there and uh, stop in, say hello. Uh, yeah. We love we love just meeting people. We love being impactful in the community. So thank you. Awesome. I think that was yeah. awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. We had a great time with you today. That yeah. hour came up really fast. So <laughs> that's, all, that's sure. always a good problem. Yeah. And yeah. it's yes. a good conversation. Yeah, for sure. I yeah. really appreciate you guys having me on. This thank has been you. a blast. Yeah. I love what you guys are doing. It's fantastic. Perfect. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. And usually we tell people when it comes up really quick is uh, odds are we'll probably have you back on next year or something. So. Sounds, sounds, <laughs> great. sounds great. I love that. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And Thanks guys. Thank yeah. you everyone that's listening. Like, comment, share, subscribe, check us out on YouTube, Apple podcast. I guess, and yeah. Spotify. I yep. mean, we're on everything, but those are three ones that work for us. Exactly. We are trying to hit 40 subscribers, which is really low, but a very huge impact for us on YouTube because the algorithm said it's going to take us until May. So if we can hit 40 oh, subscribers dude, before May. We got to do this. Yeah. Dude. Please do that because that makes me sad to only get 40 by May. So I want to get it by like March. Let's do it. <laughs> so, yes. Very cool. All right. So there's the challenge to the rest of our our listeners out there. Awesome. All right. But cheers. 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 Thanks, guys. Thank you.